Hello everyone, good afternoon to Munich. Today we will have our second virtual meetup. It's the third virtual meetup in total. Uh, we are very happy to have many people sign up. So just give you an overview. Right now we are having seven, uh, 45 people online. Uh, to today our talk, we will have great speakers like always. We will have Zwanomir from Western Digital starting. Then we will have some RISC-V simulator in your browser. We will have some updates from Gadget, from Ultrasoc about the latest uh, trace technology. And then Björn in the end will also show us the know-how you need to have and how you can help RISC-V with Linux. Before we are starting, there are two things I would like to share today. So first thing, we're always looking for new speaker. If you have something, you want to speak about RISC-V, you want to present here, please feel free to contact me. My email address you can see here, florian at uh, Of course, you also can contact me via Meetup in the message. So no problem, just contact us. The second point I would like to share today is about the coming RISC-V Summit. So right now the RISC-V Summit should be in December. Uh, and what we are looking for is for people to contribute. So that means if you have a nice topic you want to talk about, if you want to share something or if you think I made a great RISC-V simulator like the guys from the French University ESO, or if you have something like Western Digital, the latest course, or Björn, who is porting to Linux and who is looking for people to help him, or uh, Gedge, who is looking for trace solutions and always has something cool and nice upcoming, make a white paper, submit it. There is a committee and we will review your paper. So we are still looking for people. Please consider it and you can learn more information at risk5summit.com. You can find us on Twitter at risk underline five. So please submit your papers. We will have a deadline by July 10th. That is pretty soon. So it is a little bit less than two weeks. So please submit your paper. Okay. So risk five summit, submit your paper. And then I would say we are starting right away. So Zwanomir, I would give to you and looking forward to hear about the overview for Chip Alliance and Risk Five Surf course. Thank you very much, Florian. And uh, I just need a confirmation from you that I'm sharing my full screen. Yes, I can see it. Slide overview right now. Now I see a big slide. Beautiful, full screen. Excellent. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to be presenting uh, today on the third uh, uh, Munich uh, Risk uh, Five uh, meetup. Um, today's topic that I'll be talking about will be introduction to Chips Alliance. Um, and um, uh, after after introduction to the Chips Alliance, I'll I'll uh, uh, give a little bit more detail about one of the Chips Alliance projects, which is a RISC-V uh, core roadmap. So um, first, a little bit about uh, uh, Chips Alliance. Um, who are uh, we? What are the today's uh, compute requirements and challenges? And uh, 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 overview of Chips Alliance projects with some more detail about the uh, RISC V cores. So, who are we? Uh, Chips Alliance is an organization which develops and hosts open source hardware code, such as IP cores for various projects. Uh, think, uh, think open source CPUs and all the components that would need to go into open source CPUs. So, the accent is not just on uh, RISC-V uh, core IP, but also on the ancillary IPs that are needed uh, in building a CPU and um, uh, open source software design tools, think equivalent to uh, software compilers, 
uh, that are needed uh, that are needed for the build. And finally, various interconnect IPs, including uh, physical and logical layer, uh, that's uh, attracting a lot of interest. Chips Alliance is a barrier-free environment for collaboration and it follows roughly standards organization framework when it comes to collaboration development work groups that meet often and uh, make decisions about the project and uh, is based on a apache v2 license models uh, the grand idea is to share resources dollars and time to lower the cost of the hardware development when it comes to the common components between various uh, members uh, in terms of the actual uh, membership, um, the uh, board of directors has uh, Alibaba, Google, uh, Western Digital, Sci-5, Intel, um, UC Berkeley, uh, and Esperanto, and uh, uh, many other members are shown uh, here, including uh, Futureway, uh, Samsung, uh, Imperas, uh, and uh, Open Road uh, Project. When it comes to organizational structure, uh, Chips Alliance uh, is um, uh, fairly similar to RIS-5. It's been modeled uh, based on based on RIS-5. It's structured as a project in the Linux Foundation, and uh, it has a board of directors that's uh, uh, monitoring the progress of, of organization. Has the executive director. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, um, uh, directing uh, directing uh, the org, and has a technical committee uh, that uh, hosts all the different uh, all the different uh, chairs of the of the work groups and projects. And in the future, may also uh, may also host some professional staff as uh, we raise more money. Uh, the uh, Organization is a project in a, in a Linux foundation, which uh, provides a lot of uh, infrastructure help when it comes to the legal and finance, as well as the uh, uh, program uh, program manager. And finally, um, finally, similar similar to the um, uh, to the RIS-5, uh, we have an outreach uh, committee that oversees uh, organization of the events, uh, meetups, etc. Currently, the um, the uh, chair of the technical committee is Henry Cook. The uh, interim uh, executive director is Ted Marena from uh, Western Digital, uh, and uh, outreach director is uh, Michael Gilda from Antmicro. So, what are today's compute requirements and challenges? Um, today's compute requirements are very broad. Uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, there is a lot of um, uh, um, bifurcation in the market with very broad uh, set of requirements developing separately for cloud and data center for automotive for industrial IoT mobile uh, consumer etc. So there is a need for more processing wider variety of workloads, uh, which leads to increased development costs. Uh, requires broader broader expertise. Um, cost of hardware at the same time is increasing significantly, ex uh, especially when it comes to the introduction of the new lithography nodes. And um, innovation is often stalled um, as a variety of uh, workloads and use cases are developing. And um, more purpose-built architectures are needed leading uh, leading uh, to a uh, sort of broadening of all product portfolios and, and and overall increase in different part numbers that need to be managed so how does chips lines help here well the the key goals are to lower the cost of development and to really leverage the common ip so risk 5 cores is an excellent example of the common ip that's uh, that's required by many many different uh, companies that are engaged uh, engaged in the various uh, embedded electronics designs. Uh, other components are neural network uh, uh, accelerator, 
then then variety of ancillary and core components needed to build the SOCs such as PC Express and DDR and interconnects as well. Overarching to uh, to integrating all those components are open source software design tools, and uh, this is uh, this is really an area where we are focusing a lot of lot of our efforts. And uh, the idea in general is that um, open source collaboration can now benefit hardware as well, same as uh, for last 20 years has greatly benefited software to development of the Linux uh, operating system and a GNU set of tools. So in a, in a loose analogy, uh, for us, uh, RISC-5 cores and RISC-5 based CPUs represent the equivalent of Linux OS and development of the software de uh, design tools uh, such as RTL simulator, uh, open road uh, um, place and route and synthesis, they represent a rough equivalent of the GNU uh, tools. Um, and uh, in addition to, to uh, uh, great efforts in open source RTL IP and open source software, there is also a um, accent on new business model uh, development and promotion of open source policies so um, uh, one great example of one of the partnerships that came from chips alliance is uh, a western digital partnership with codesip that's now providing uh, official uh, support and uh, design integration services on top of open source ip that resides on a, on a github In terms of events, um, our uh, inaugural event was held last year in Mountain View, uh, June 19, 2019, on the Google campus, followed by a design verification workshop that was in Munich uh, last year in November, uh, and uh, Chips Alliance and Chisel workshop that was held in Milpitas in January. Uh, unfortunately, due to uh, due to COVID crisis, we had to first postpone and then for now cancel our planned face-to-face uh, -face workshop in China that was going to be hosted by Alibaba. Um, and uh, it's kind of difficult to say exactly when we would uh, go back to actually having a face-to-face a -face workshop. It's completely dependent on the, on the current crisis. But uh, instead, uh, we took advantage of the higher popularity of online meetings and we have held many meetups starting March this year. Actually, so many, it, it doesn't make sense to list them on a slide. Um, and now, uh, uh, overview of the projects. So current projects uh, in the uh, in the CHIPS Alliance uh, are uh, structured into a uh, five work groups. Uh, probably the biggest uh, work group is a CHISEL work group. Chisel is a new um, uh, hardware compiler architecture popularized, uh, developed by UC Berkeley and popularized by Sci5 in their portfolio of products. Um, and uh, Chisel Workgroup uh, has the largest number of developers, about uh, 40. The second uh, big group, big group is Interconnect Workgroup. Um, Interconnect Workgroup has three projects: Tiling 2.0 which is a new version of the cache coherence and interconnect protocol tiling. Um, then uh, AIB, which is a chiplet's uh, physical uh, interface specification that uh, has been donated by Intel Corporation. And OmniExtend, which uh, represents a layering of uh, tiling over Ethernet that uh, started as a Western digital project, but now has a multiple multiple parties in Chips Alliance developing. The third work group is Rocket SOC that also came from Berkeley. And it's a SOC generator that's based on the Rocket uh, RISC-5 uh, core. Then a cores work group, which will be a, a topic of the second part of the talk today. Uh, Swerve uh, family, of course, came from Western Digital and uh, covers uh, several important use cases uh, for embedded application. And finally, tools work group that uh, hosts a, um, a development of very later RTL simulator system Verilog extensions, which is a big project with uh, many participants from USA and Europe 
that's uh, sort of targeting uh, bringing up Verilator to the big scene of design verification by supporting all the system Verilog semantics. Fuse SOC tool, uh, including integration of the RIS-5 cores, and CocoTB uh, Python-based design verification flow uh, that uh, we worked on earlier this year in extending uh, support for the Verilator RTL simulator. So let me now switch gears and uh, start talking a little bit about the RISC-V uh, course specifically in the Chips Alliance. This is a non-complete uh, roadmap of a variety of the open source course. There is many more, but uh, we just sort of listed the popular course that came from Berkeley, like Rocket and Boom. Uh, then obviously there's a Pulp uh, project uh, uh, that uh, hosts many exciting and interesting uh, RISC-V cores like Ariane and Risky. And then Invest in Digital, uh, we have been uh, we have been focusing on on a server family of course that I'll talk a little bit more about today, covering in between uh, performance uh, range uh, more performant than than uh, a classical five or six stage uh, pipeline uh, single threaded cores and uh, uh, typically super super scalar. Uh, and covering embedded uh, use cases. So this is the uh, RISC uh, five cores uh, roadmap in Chips Alliance. The first generation of cores uh, is called Swerve EH1, and the second generation of cores are called Swerve EH2 and EL2. EH1 core was a 32-bit nine-stage uh, superscalar dual-issue core targeting 28 nanometer TSMC, and Swer VH2 is a multi-threaded upgrade to Swer VH1, so it actually supports two threads, and it targets 16 nanometer TSMC. Swer VL2 is a um, spin on a very small core, so it's a small four-stage core, optimized for speed and size. It's a single issue and it targets implementation of sequencers and finite state machines for a variety of embedded applications. So I talked uh, uh, multiple times about the Swerve EH1 uh, core. Uh, just as a recap, it's a A-stage pipeline or, 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 or nine-stage if you include the right back. Uh, it has uh, it features two pipes, so it, it features superscalar pipeline, and it has four execution units. Uh, they are showed as EX1 and EX4 in this block diagram, and these execution these dual execution units allow uh, sort of uh, uh, fulfillment of missed chances if there is a, a missed opportunity to execute at the beginning of the pipeline. Uh, for example, uh, because of uh, remote uh, memory access, um, after uh, after two clock cycles in an EX4, there is a second opportunity to actually execute the same instruction, and this allows uh, uninterrupted uh, instruction flow and improve the IPS IPC. Uh, we feature um, low to use of two. Um, three cycle multiply, multiply pipe uh, latency and up to 34 cycles for division. This score uh, comfortably reaches about four point, very close to five actually, more than 4.95 core marks per megahertz um, and is, uh, and is uh, uh, one of the most, uh, one of the highest performance uh, embedded risc five cores. Uh, Swerve EL2 core is a second generation core. Uh, it uh, follows uh, RISC-V 32-bit uh, uh, IMC architecture, integer, multiply, and uh, compress instructions, and also supports uh, ZBB and ZBS uh, bit manipulation instructions. It has a four-stage uh, pipe uh, to commit. Um, worst case branch mispredict uh, is uh, one. Uh, and um, it supports uh, fast interrupts, uh, enhanced DMA support, 
and gets a um, core mark per megahertz of about uh, 3.6, which is sort of very close to the theoretically uh, maximum value that a uh, uh, that a single issue pipeline can achieve. The target frequency is 600 megahertz in the 16 nanometer TSMC technology. SWIR VH2 core is a second uh, generation uh, design based on SWIR VH1. It has the uh, same pipeline. Um, it supports uh, 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 RIS-5 32-bit uh, integer, multiply, atomic, and compressed instructions, as well as uh, bit manipulation instructions. It's a nine-stage uh, pipeline, including uh, write-back. And uh, the novelty it brings is a multi-thread support. And this is the um, this is uh, probably not the first one, but one of the first very mature and properly verified multi-threaded cores in the RIS-5 open source world. It supports uh, fast interrupts, enhanced DMA support, number of different buses, including uh, uh, AXI bus. It um, reaches a 2.9 score on the drystone benchmark and uh, 4.95 core mark per megahertz on a single thread benchmark matching obviously the h1 uh, core performance with which it shares the pipeline and 6.3 core marks uh, per megahertz if you are running two threads simultaneously the target frequency for this core is 1.2 gigahertz a little bit more about the sphere vh2 pipeline uh is uh, that uh, we have introduced uh, support for dual threads dual threads uh, is an exciting uh, feature for embedded applications obviously you need to introduce uh, you, you you need to add more resources for um for registers for each heart as well um uh, 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 uh but but you can you can actually you can actually uh, share um, uh, complete uh, logic logic of the core. So this kind of leads to a, a, a modest increase in the in the uh, core area, typically about uh, twenty to twenty five percent, including the memories that you need to double for each uh, heart. Uh, but everything else can be shared, and in return you actually get uh, a uh, two uh, RIST-5 hearts. In those uh, applications uh, where going to the bus or slow memory is, is very often, like in many embedded use cases in uh, Western digital storage controllers, uh, essentially what you get is, is a uh, performance of uh, two RIST-5 cores for the area of what's essentially one core. So your performance to power and performance to area benchmarks are significantly uh, increased with multi-threading. Um, and uh, in our case, the uh, the threading is uh, true simultaneous multi-threading, and we support uh, we support uh, two two threads per pipe, uh, and uh, uh, we can commit up to two different threads uh, per cycle. Uh, in terms of the IPC. Uh, we are able to uh, we are able to get uh, IPC of 0.79 for single thread, uh, assuming uh, load to use of 11 cycles from external bus, and uh, um, IPC of about 1.5 for multi-thread, bringing about uh, 1.9 uh, speed up over single thread on the same uh, on the same workload. And in this uh, example of the M sort, you can see. Uh, the nice uh, uh, filling uh, of the of the resources in the pipeline by executing uh, two threads at the same time. Uh, in terms of the in terms of the performance, um, uh, as uh, as we are increasing uh, as we are cre increasing the um, uh, single threaded instruction per clock cycle, which is shown up on the x axis. On the y-axis, we show the multi-thread instructions per clock cycle, and ideal performance uh, is uh, shown in green, uh, which basically shows uh, as single threads are climbing up to one, you can get two instructions per cycle in a multi-thread. 
and then the red dots are showing our actual performance and uh, you can see that we are doing as well as it's theoretically possible basically tracking tracking the green curve and getting a really nice really nice utilization of the resources uh, as you get to about 0 0.8 um, and then um, uh, converging converging uh, towards uh, two instructions per clock cycle on a larger IPCs for the single threads. Uh, where do these cores typically go? Well, for for the use cases in Western Digital, uh, we uh, use them for our flash uh, controllers, actually now for HDD controllers as well. Typically, there is a one core that sits in the front end and is uh, managing the host controller interface, uh, such as NVM Express in the case of the PCI Express SSDs. And there is another core that sits on a data path and uh, coordinates error correction engine and a small EL type cores that are implementing the toggle sequencers that directly talk to the NAND, uh, NAND memory. Another very popular application for, for Western Digital is a root of trust and encryption management. So there is a core that uh, sort of uh, uh, manages the protocols uh, for, for uh, authentication and for encryption and loads the, uh, loads the encryption keys into the encryption engine uh, uh, post the successful authentication. And um, in the conclusion, Western Digital continues its commitment to RISC-V. Uh, we have uh, been on a path uh, of uh, continuing our plans to deliver 1 billion RISC-V cores in uh, different uh, products. We have uh, multiple generation now cores across a multiple set of uh, SOCs that are uh, uh, that are marching towards this goal, and we have released the second generation of the Swerve cores uh, in Chips Alliance, and uh, um, and we have partnered with Codasip to provide the professional grade uh, customer support and and uh, and verification services. And uh, RTL of the course is located on a GitHub, uh, uh, on the Chips Alliance GitHub uh, under the course dash swerve and core dash swerve eh2 and core course dash swerve uh, um, uh, el2. And uh, thank you very thank you very much uh, for listening. And uh, um, it's uh, it's been a great pleasure and opportunity to speak here. Cool. Thanks for your presentation. Uh, we got one question, and the question is coming from Mohamed. He is asking, where can we find the neural network accelerator mentioned in the common IP? So that was oh. in the beginning of your presentation. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you. Great question. Uh, is uh, I'm not ready to announce the name yet. We, we have uh, another company that has uh, joined Chips Alliance this week. So just watch our uh, watch our Twitter and press releases. We'll probably announce it uh, within the next uh, few weeks. A uh, company that has joined the Chips Alliance uh, uh, hasn't prepared their marketing and PR yet, but they'll be they will be donating the the source code of their uh, inference uh, accelerator. So we'll we'll, we'll soon have we'll soon have a. Uh, uh, a work group uh, formed. Well, cool. That's great news. So basically, if I understand you right, Risk Five Meetup in Munich is the first time you're announcing this. One of our users spotted it, and you say, "Be patient. We will have more information soon on our yeah, yeah, channel." We, cor correct. We had we had uh, an ambition cool. to form to form the, such work group for a while, but uh, we couldn't exactly decide what should be the starting uh, IP. We looked at a number of uh, university projects, but uh, yeah, now now we we are gaining such starting point very soon. Okay, cool. Now, uh, so there is a second question coming, Swanomir. To become a member, should we necessarily be a company, or there are individuals to contribute to the projects? Uh, so any individual can uh, can contribute, can join and contribute on the projects via GitHub. And for GitHub uh, contributions, there is no there is no uh, 
requirement of being a member, uh, except for maybe some uh, online um, online uh, uh, acceptance of the uh, licensing uh, Apache with licensing conditions and a code of conduct. Uh, in addition to corporate membership, we do also have a academic membership, uh, which is uh, free. Okay. So that means also undergraduate students can go to the GitHub, accept the code of conduct, accept the license and start contributing and bringing stuff, correct? That's correct, yes. Okay, cool. Downloading and contributing, yes. Cool. Nice. Then thank you very much, Zvonomir, for your presentations. That was really cool. Thanks for answering the questions. Thank you, Floria, for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Then I would say we are going straight to the next one. Uh, so there is one more question popping up right now. Only undergrad or graduate students as well. I think I can answer this. So. Chips Alliance as well as Risk Five, everyone is welcome. So you just go to the GitHub, you can download the things, you can bring your patches, contribute. So it doesn't really matter who you are. If you're interested, if you're good at code, just go and get crazy or get wild. <laughs> That's great. Uh, great. Then I would say we are coming to the next presentation. The next presentation today is from Joam Sabaton. He works at the ESEO. This is a French school of engineering in electronics and computer science. Uh, sir, he is teaching the embedded system and digital electronics to the students. He is also involved in a few research projects in the field of geophysics, where he develops embedded digital signal processing systems for optical seismic sensors. So actually in our last meetup, there was Raul, who is also here today, thanks very much Raul, and he has pointed out, hey, we from ESEO, we have some cool RISC-V simulator who let you see how the program's going. But let me pass to Jum. Jum, are you online? Yes, I am, hello. Hello, should we start Hello? your video directly or you want to say something? We can hear you very I, clear. Okay, I think you can start directly. Okay, perfect. This talk is about a visual instruction set simulator that we have developed to teach computer architecture to beginners at ESU, a French school of engineering in electronics and computer science. The curriculum at ESU covers many topics. In the first year of engineering studies, we propose an introduction to embedded systems and digital electronics. In the first semester, computer architecture is exposed from the point of view of a software developer who needs to understand how a computer works. In the second semester, students learn the basics of digital circuit design and FPGAs. The perspective changes from using a computer to making a computer. What about using the same instruction set architecture in both semesters? Our ideal architecture would be free to use, study and implement without asking for permission. It would have a simple and regular instruction set, easy to understand and to implement in hardware by beginners. It would be a good illustration of the concepts used in commercial processors today, and it would have a free and open source toolchain. Several options were considered, including creating our own architecture. We were ready to settle on a trade-off between these requirements, but we learned about RISC-V, and we found that it was very close to our ideal architecture. So we made two things. We developed a small processor core called Virgul that implements most instructions from the base unprivileged RISC-V instruction set. Virgul follows the embedded RV32E programmer's model with 16 general purpose registers. It does not support memory ordering instructions, environment call or breakpoints. 
The core and its bus interface are simple enough so that a student could implement it with appropriate guidance. Then, we developed a simulator that matches the architecture of our processor core. It implements exactly the same instruction set and the same interrupt mechanism. The simulator can help answer several questions about how a computer works. How are data and instructions represented in memory? What are the typical steps to run an instruction? And which functional units are involved in each step? How peripherals are mapped to memory addresses? What is an interrupt? To fulfill these goals, we took inspiration from a simulator developed by Peter Higginson for a similar purpose. We wanted to have a visual representation of the processor's functional units and buses, with animated data transfers while an instruction is executed. Our simulator has a very specific scope. It provides the appropriate abstraction level to illustrate a typical computer architecture, independently of a specific hardware implementation. For this reason, it is not cycle accurate. It is an educational tool and is not meant to be used as a general purpose debugger, in terms of features as well as performance. What does it look like? Emulsive is a web application that runs in most recent browsers. The simulated computer has 4 kilobytes of RAM. The user interface provides a memory view that shows raw hexadecimal data as well as an assembly column that can also show an integer or ASCII representation of data. The data path view shows an abstract representation of the functional units of the processor. The yellow boxes are registers. The arrows are not actual hardware buses, but rather a representation of the possible data transfers. Basic I.O. peripherals are available, but more will come in a future version. On the left, text input and output devices model a very basic character receiver and transmitter. They are attached to text fields in the user interface, where users can type characters or where characters are displayed. The text input device can be configured to request interrupts. On the right, the bitmap view has 32 rows of 32 pixels and is mapped to the last kilobyte of RAM with 8 bits per pixel. When executing a program, you can choose between several options. The Run button will run the program from the current instruction and continue until the program is paused or until a breakpoint is met. The Step button executes instructions one by one. The Fetch, Decode, ALU, Compare, MemReg and PC indicators show the current elementary step of an instruction execution, but users can also click on them to trigger the animation of a specific step. You can find the simulator at this address. I will now make a short demo of the main features. The first thing that you can do when you open the simulator for the first time is to choose an example from the drop-down menu. The default program corresponds to the Hello example. It will simply display Hello in the text output. The memory view shows the raw current content of the RAM. The rightmost column shows the same data in a human-readable form. It can be assembly instructions, but also ASCII characters. This reveals the hello string starting at address 20x. At startup, the program counter is 0, which means that execution will start at address 0. Let's animate the execution of the first instruction. I will enable animations and set them to a reasonable speed. In the fetch step, the simulator shows how the processor reads an instruction from memory. The current program counter is copied to the address bus. The data word at this address is available from the data bus and is copied to the instruction register. In the decode step, we show the meaning of each instruction field. The current operation to perform, the source and destination register numbers, the immediate value. 
In this case, an add immediate operation has been recognized with x0 as source register, x1 as the destination register, and 20x as the immediate operand. The operation input of the ALU and comparator are updated accordingly. The ALU step computes the arithmetic or logic operation result from the operands A and B. And when applicable, for conditional branch instructions, a compare step can also be available. The memreg step updates the target register or memory location. In this case, the result is copied to X1. The PC step updates the program counter. Let's run the program until the next store instruction. I will first disable the animations temporarily, set a breakpoint in front of the SB instruction, and press run. At this point, we can see that X2 is C followed by seven zeros, which is the address of the data buffer of the character transmitter. X3 is 48 in hexadecimal, which is the ASCII code for an H character. The SB instruction will copy this byte to the data buffer of the character transmitter, and hopefully, an H will be displayed. In the memreg step, we can see that the ALU result is copied to the address bus, and X3 is copied to the data bus. Finally, an interesting feature of the simulator is the ability to edit the memory content directly in hexadecimal, assembly, or ASCII form, for instance. We can modify the current instruction to update X1 by 2 instead of 1. Let's rewrite it as add i x1 x1 2. You can see that the instruction has been re-encoded with the new immediate value. We can also manipulate the bitmap view directly by editing the last kilobyte of RAM. Clicking in the bitmap will highlight the memory location that corresponds to the current pixel. For instance, we can set this pixel to white by writing FF in the corresponding byte. This interface encourages experimentation. Students can freely observe the effects of a program when the content of memory changes. The simulator has been used with success during the first semester of this year, and we are progressively creating new exercises and challenges for our students. MLSIV is free software. See the links at the bottom right of the screen to read its documentation, get the source code, report issues and contribute to its development. Thanks for your attention. Björn, the stage is yours. Welcome to Munich. Thank you. Um, can you hear me okay, first, first of all? Perfectly. Perfect. Okay, so let me see. I, I have can... a question. I see your bookshelf. It's very empty, but there is one book, and it seems like the risk five readers is this correct. Yeah, yeah, I had to clean it out. So I'm redoing the basement, but I kept, you know, the most important one. Okay, I like this. Focus uh, on the importance. Okay, so can you first of all, can you see my screen? Yes. And is it full screen now? It is, yes. Okay, good stuff. So let's start. So the topic is what's missing in RISC-V Linux and how you can help out. So again, first of all, Florian, thank you for inviting me. Um, uh, it'll be fun, hopefully. So I would say this is not a super technical talk. It's more of the inspirational kind. Uh, so for example, how you guys out there or you folks can you know find an interesting Linux project to work on within the scope of RISC-V. So you know to get you started, I really wanted this picture of a penguin, you know, as Uncle Sam pointing at you, you know. But I'm not a graphics guy, so and everything I found on Google had a copyright and stuff, so I had to you know I had to do it myself. So. You know, picture yourself like a penguin, you know, full of enthusiasm and energy, and he's pointing at you. You know, it's wearing this, you know, Uncle Sam hat. I don't know, didn't quite work out, but hopefully you get that message anyway, right? So, real short bits about me before we get started. So, my name is Bjorn, and I work for this big uh, ship vendor, and uh, all my RISC-V work is being done as a hobby. So, 
you know, nothing serious. Uh, but I really tried to, you know, convince my colleagues at Intel to, you know, drop that legacy x86 stuff and go all in on Risk Five. But you know, quite frankly, it's not going as good as I was hoping for. But we'll see, you know, die trying and all that. Uh, so from a kernel perspective, so I maintain the Risk Five eBBF JIT and also something called AFXP. So AFXP is a fast path socket for raw Ethernet frames, and that's so AFXP is what I do at Intel pretty much. So that and a lot of things networking from a kernel perspective. And finally, so I will also host a Swedish Risk Five meetup, and you know nothing as good as fancy as Florian's, but you know we try to, and we haven't had our first uh, meetup first. We have one planned for April, but then you know all this COVID nineteen things happen, so we had to postpone it. Okay, so enough of that. Okay, so let's talk a bit about the Risk Five Linux port. So in Linux version four fifteen, I think. Uh, Linux gained uh, Risk Five support, and this was two years ago on January the 28th. And uh, most of the work was done by Palmer Dabbled, which is now at Google, but I think it was at Sci Five at the time. Uh, so today, the latest version is 5.8, uh, release candidate two, which was uh, tagged by Linux last Sunday. So, question is now, after the initial port of an architecture, so when it's been upstreamed, what happens then? So is it done? Can we sort of stop working on RISC-5 now? So let's have a look. So the org directory uh, in the Linux kernel tree, that's where you find, obviously, all the architecture specific code. So I just used uh, git to dump all the lines of code. And you know, unfortunately, this is this command will dump, you know, all the lines of, of the text files in there. So you'll get, you know, device trees and stuff, but it's, it will still give you sort of a hunch where the lay of land is. So uh, I would say the three major Linux architectures today are ARM64, Power, and x86. So, you know, some might claim that 32-bit ARM is still there. I didn't include that, but fair enough. So it's still a bit, really big architecture, but I didn't include that in the statistics. So ARM64, obviously powering all the mobile phones, and you know now getting traction into the data center with you know players like Amazon, AWS, and uh, startups like Ampere and Nuvia. Uh, Power and PowerPC is the sort of IBM's old workhorse, and like the previous embedded king before uh, ARM and Risk Five came around. And then x86, obviously the first and most complete port. You know, Linux was built for x86, so it has, you know, it was started out there. Um, I also included CSky uh, into this list, which is the most recent architecture. And he was, uh, you know, Ar uh, Arnd Bergman, which is uh, uh, handles the new architectures in the kernel, said that CSky is probably the last architect architecture to be added because, you know, after Risk V. Uh, companies start to go for risk five instead of something homebrew, which is good. So that's kind of interesting. So let's like look at the lines of code here. So I mean, all the three major architectures which are considered to have good support, they are at least 10x compared lines of code compared to risk five. And if you look at CSK, it's even less than risk five, but then it's a recent one. So obviously there are things missing from the port. So the question is what and how you guys get in. So I don't know if you've seen this meme, but uh, you know, you think of an idea, but there's always some other guy that has thought of it before. And you know, a colleague of mine said that you know, all things in computer science has already been done by IBM in the 70s. So you know that feeling, like you want to hack on something, but it's done. Uh, and you know, if you're into kernel architectures uh, or <laughs> porting th things, it's the same in the kernel. Like you want to say you want to work on. K probes. It's already been done. So you're always late on the ball. Okay. But, you know, not with Risk 5. So I would say this is a great way of getting into like an architecture from a Linux perspective or kernel perspective. So it's a great way to learn how the kernel works and, you know, all the nitty gritty details uh, and everything. You know, and we're still early days for Risk 5. So, I mean, you can be part of the journey watching, you know, your favorite instructions that grew up, which is, uh, you know, it's a lot of fun. 
And still, you know, the community is still pretty small. Uh, and, you know, at least I consider it friendly. So, like, I encourage you, like, sign up to Risk Five mail, mail, mailing list. Uh, and, you know, start re reading, reading the posts, uh, start asking questions because, you know, it's a friendly environment and uh, everybody's welcome. And there's also like a great archive at lorekernel.org if you want to, you know, read old posts and dig through all the mails. All right, so what has been happening lately in Risk Five Land? So uh, most uh, recently, Nathan added like a two-liner patch so that a kernel built with Clang, which is a compiler, I wouldn't say like similar to GCC. Uh, so actually, Clang built kernels can boot now. So Palmer did a lot of the initial work, but then Nathan added like the final patch, which is two lines to actually make it boot. Uh, KG JDB support was landed and also sparse mem. So sparse mem is uh, like a more advanced uh, physical memory model. So you, before that, it was only flat mem. So by enabling sparse mem, you can uh, enable things like memory hot swapping, uh, stuff like that in, in the risk five port. As for the ongoing work, so the KVM port has actually been stable for quite some time here, so, but it hasn't been merged yet because there's no silicon that actually is implementing the H extension. So it, it works really well on the uh, like emulator side, but that's the reason. So, and, and this patch series is real stable. So, so it'll, hopefully when we get actual silicon, it will be upstream. And then there's Nick working on the KX, K dump support. And I think the patch series on V3 right now. Uh, what else? Yeah, so uh, Patrick sent out an RFC for K probes. So RFC in the Linux land is like a request for comment is uh, an initial patch series asking in the community, like, what do people think about this? Uh, so he sent out an RFC for K probes and K red probes. Uh, but then uh, sort of the, the work stalled. So uh, Guren from Alabama. Uh, picked up uh, the work, and Gua also did the C Sky K probe support. So he's you know he's done that before, which is nice. Uh, one of the real interesting parts about the K probe support it, is that a port need to be able to simulate almost all of the instructions or some of the instructions on the architecture. So adding support for K probes involves a lot of code. So if you look for example in Power and ARM and x86. There's a lot of code in the org directory just simulating instructions for stepping code. All right, so before we get into the actual project, so what do you need to be able to contribute? Well, basically nothing more than a regular laptop. You need a recent QMU, which is an emulator. Uh, so you can actually boot your kernels and your system. You need a cross compiler. And now there's not only GCC, you can actually use Clang as well. Uh, and a root file system. And, you know, I'm an old Debian guy, so I'm obviously using that. And that's it. So it's, you know, if you have a laptop, you're good to go. And if you want, you can also buy like a Linux capable board, but they are still somewhat expensive, unfortunately. So they're in the ra price range of 500 to $900. So it's, yeah, it's, they're a bit pricey, but hopefully more vendors will actually get out there so it will be cheaper. All right, so let's see what we can work on. So first you can, uh, in the kernel, you can actually list the supported features uh, for specific architectures. So let's do that for RISC-V. So if we grab for to do and for okay, we can see that, okay, there's 20 things to do and there's 12, that's okay. So obviously there's more to be done. So let's look at that list. And here's, here's the list and don't worry, about reading, not being able to read it. It's just that, you know, there's a lot of items that you out there can work on. So what does it all mean? Well, one way of finding out is like entering uh, the org directory for say ARM64 uh, and using a git annotate for the, uh, uh, for the kconfig. And that'll show what commit uh, a certain, uh, feature was added. 
and usually the commit or the merge message will explain it pretty well. So let's look at a few. So the first one is actually not something to do. It's so an architecture has either CBPF support or eBPF support. So eBPF supersedes the CBPF JIT, and RISC V has uh, eBPF support. So the next one that I took was jump labels, which is you know text uh, patch branching, and it's used a lot in the kernel actually. And uh, this requires something called uh, ASM go to, which I don't know if the RISC V GCC and uh, Clang support works for. So that's something. Please take a look and see, like, can we add jump labels to kernel? Try it out. Next, just an example is the debug VM uh, debug VM PG table. Uh, and I just pulled out the commit there. So yeah, sure. It has been done for ARM64, so have a look at the commit. Maybe it's you know trivial to add it to Risk Five as well. Uh, then there's the K probes, which is a GUI is hacking on, and there's a link there to the actual mail about it. And you know he might need some help as well, you know, trying it out, reviewing patches. So there are some really big things like K probes, and some is more about testing with a specific configuration, like does the kernel boot if I enable this? And, or does it need to be tweaked from a uh, risk five perspective? I know other than the features that I listed before, that's it's much more. So for example, you can investigate what needs to be done to support the real-time patches with a preempt RT, which is, I don't think it's upstream yet, but they're working on upstream more and more of the uh, preempt RT patches. Uh, and that definitely has, uh, case for you know the embedded scenario so please try it out uh, also like turning on more sanitizers you know the UB san and the kc san like you know clang 11 has support for it but does it work for risk 5 try it out and if it works you know tell us on the mailing list what else like making sure that the perf supports more counters so that you know can help developers to write more efficient code uh, and for example, exposing uh, what the previous presentation was about with the like uh, process of trace, but for risk five, for example, using Ultrasox work. Uh, better oops and splat. So when a kernel crash, you know, on other architectures, you get a nice backtrace, and you know, a hex code dump of the uh, instructions surrounding the crash, but not on risk five. So that's you know, pretty nice contained uh, feature that you can work on. Uh, what else? Right now, we, only, we don't support compressed instructions in the BPF JIT, but uh, the Unix specification for RISC V actually says that compressed uh, instructions must be supported. So that would, you know, help if uh, if we added compressed instructions there as well, It'd probably improve performance and you know uh, the memory footprint for the code. Obviously, documentation like. Well, nobody's want to work on documentation. <laughs> so if you want to do that, great. And finally, like alternative runtime patching. And that's even more being that, that is when we want to start to support more risk five extensions, the kernel must be able to load different functions depending on uh, what functionality you support. So for example, if the bit manipulation uh, is supported, then maybe the kernel want to load functions compiled differently for uh, for this core. Do then you know ARM64 and x86 uses this extensively, so that would be a good thing as well. And I mean, if you're not a uh, testing person, or if you're a testing person, uh, then a more de developer kind of person, then you know there's things to be done here as well. So. There are two major uh, CI and testing services out there. So there's kernel CI, and then there's the LKFT from the Naro. And uh, well, you know, they boot different architectures and they try out different configuration, making sure it boots. And then on top of that, it runs a bunch of tests. So, you know, making sure that RISC V works on these uh, for these services, and so that we can, you know, rely on that Linux will be stable for RISC V as well. And not just you know the other platforms for architectures. 
And also, like if, if there's missing tests, add them. Try it out on Risk Five. Uh, what else? Yeah, there's a lot of tests in tool testing self tests, which is the kernel self test. And uh, like, make sure they pass on Risk Five. Like, do do anyone run them? We don't know. Please try it out. Uh, then there's another testing framework called KUnit, which uh, I can honestly say I haven't really looked at it, but it's more, it's a unit testing fr framework for the kernel and they have a lot of tests. So obviously we should try to use that for, or run them on risk five as well. And finally, like review patches, you know, people post patches on the list, have a look at them, you know, try to understand them, try them out, ask questions, you know. And then finally, if you're like more of an assembly kind of person, you can actually fine tune uh, like the libc functions for risk five, for example. So uh, on the left hand side, we have you know what risk five implemented. So we have an implementation for memset and memcopy in risk five assembly, uh, whereas x86 have you know they have optimized a whole bunch of instructions. So if you're into assembly fiddling, that's you know go ahead. It's the try to beat the compiler game. So, you know, that'll keep you busy, right? Uh, at least over the summer. Uh, but on, on a more serious note, like why I'm talking about this. So, well, first, it, I can honestly say it's, it's a lot of fun. Otherwise, I wouldn't do it, you know, in my spare time. So, but we all want Risk Five to accelerate and, you know, be the major ISA, like so. If we do some crystal ball gazing and you know use some more metrics, how is you know the risk five port actually doing compared to other ports? So I took uh, I took the commits for ARM64 and risk five. Actually, I forgot one thing. So uh, I used a script from from uh, uh, Torsten, which is uh, please follow me on him on Twitter. He has all these great. Uh, Linux tweets, so it's it's at kernel logger, so kudos there. Okay, back to this short. So so I compared um, uh, ARM64 and RISC V, and so ARM64 was introduced at kernel uh, 3.7, uh, and again uh, RISC V 4.15. So as you can see, uh, the amount and this is non-merge commits, so it's only plain commits. And, you know, commit, so it doesn't really say line of code, but it says sort of, you know, hints about how, how much work is being done in the kernel. Uh, so if, as you can see with ARM64, it sort of took off after 4.0. It's like then we have a ni nice linear scale. Uh, whereas, you know, right now risk five looks kind of flat. So if we time shift that, it's, it's, uh, I wouldn't say it's not disturbingly flat, but we need we, more work need to be done in order to, for this to take off. And hopefully it'll be quicker than, I'm hoping that we can actually benefit from the work that the ARM64 uh, people did to you know, accelerate uh, the risk five port. Because, you know, a risk is a risk, sort of. So, we really need more involvement. And uh, I guess, you know, that picture had that the picture, you know, that penguin again in your head. <laughs> and, you know, don't hesitate to reach out on the list. So, and, you know, it's great to do some kernel hacking on your vacation. That's pretty much it from my side. So any questions? Cool, thanks Bjorn for your for your extensive uh, <laughs> overview. I'm still it baffled. Quick. It was covering everything. It was very quick, but everything inside. Yeah, uh, yeah it was. Actually, <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> we actually got a question from Gupta, and he is asking, you mentioned that Linux Risk V is new enough to learn about internals of kernel. Are there any beginner-friendly tasks too for contributors? As I have just started with Risk V, and I'm interested in both Risk V and Linux. So, is yeah. there something simple you could start with? 
Yeah, definitely. So you still see the slides, right? So if I yep. yeah, so if I go back to, for example, this list, you know, you can pretty much like pick anything of this list, and then you'll soon realize like, is this a big task? For example, w when you dig up uh, the amount of work that was done for ARM64, for example, like what was was that? If that amount of code for that commit was a lot, then it's then it might be you know a tricky thing. But then, for example, take this one, the uh, the U enabling UBSAN for Risk Five. That could be a matter of just you know trying to build the kernel with that turned on and see if it boots. So uh, I would say I mean that there it's all over the range. Yeah, uh, I haven't graded them, but there's you know for, for beginners definitely. And again, like the amount of code, like you can actually get into the boot code and you know understanding it, and walking it through. I mean, if you try to do that on you know x86, that's it's not as simple. So I would say it's really at this point in time, it's really beginner friendly. Yeah, because it's really in the starting phase, so it's not too complicated yet. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, we have more questions. So, Jadef is asking, why do you think commits of ARM64 compared to RISC V? RISC V is almost flat to ARM64. Why? Uh, like, uh, so if I try to understand the question, so why why I compared it to, or why why I I. I think, I think that, the question is why it's so flat. Why ARM has so many commits and Risk Five has almost no or very less. Yeah, yeah. Well, for, first, I mean, I mean, Android for ARM you know, has been driving a lot of Linux work, and then there's you know, for example, Linaro, which is uh, like a company formed just to enable, uh, you know, to to speed up the enable uh, the uh, the ARM kernel work, we, we don't have that in uh, uh, Risk Five. So there's you know the, there's a couple of companies companies work working on the kernel, but there's no like dedicated force, I would say. So we need you know to, uh, yeah. we need to get more involvement. And I, honestly, like from a personal side, I think companies need to step up and say that, hey, we, we want to, you know, dedicate people to actually work on the kernel. Yeah. Because that, that's what ARM64 has, which, you know, Risk 5 doesn't. So actually, the next question is what you just mentioned, Linaro. Drew is asking, do you think we need something like Linaro? <sighs> Uh, maybe, yeah, maybe. Maybe, yeah. Unless the company, I mean, if if you look at the, you know, Intel is doing a lot of work for Linux because you know Linux is pretty much Intel. So yeah. unless unless you know a company like Sci Five or uh, you know Andes. Andes or, technology. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so other than that, it'll be you know it'll continue if we're only relying on you know. Uh, people working on their spare time, it'll be flat for a while. Yeah. Uh, so there is another question from Lucas. He's asking, what is the best board and or emulator to use to get started for Linux kernel support testing? I would say QMU. QMU, yeah. Yeah, from the hardware side, I we had the question in our last meetups. There are not really many choices right now. Sci5 has a, a Linux capable system which you can buy, but it's quite pricey. Microchip is now bringing an FPGA with four core 64 bit, but that will be also not just a hobby project. So yeah, it's, I, I think it was like five hundred dollars, right? Like that. So it's, I mean, it's it's compared to like you know, uh, Raspberry Pi. Like it's, 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 yeah. yeah, it's super expensive. So hopefully, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll get a board sometime. But if you want to start, you know, filling around with the kernel, you know, just the software emulator is that's sufficient. But it, of course, it's more fun with actual board. So yeah. 
Okay, the next question is uh, from Dmitry. He's asking is Kasan supported? And if not, it might be good to put it on a to-do item list too. Yeah, it's actually supported. So it was, I should probably put it on a slide, but it was, it, it, it landed upstream pretty recently, perhaps, you know, uh, okay, the last cool. the previous kernel or kernel before that. So it's, it's actually in the, it's, it's in the port, but good point. Okay, cool. Uh, then we have, okay, Dmitry again. Not exactly a question, but more of a shameless plug on the testing CI front, size, size scalar, kernel fuzzer, now supports six Linux arches, adding RISC-V would be useful too. Yeah, that's true. I've, ooh, that's that's a really good point. I forgot to add that on the slide. I thought about it, but I completely forgot about it. So the, the syscaller and the fuzzer, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that should definitely be part of it because that tool is amazing. I has found a lot, a lot of, you know, weird bugs. So definitely something to work on. I should actually add that directly on to the slides. Thank you. Okay, cool. Thanks to Dmitry. Uh, then we have last two questions I'm seeing here. Yuri is asking, sorry, I, begins, I missed the beginning of the recording. Will it be available? Yes, we, the recording will be available. We will put it on YouTube. Just give us a few days so we should have it up online by Tuesday next week. And every one of the presenters will most likely have it on Twitter. So just check the meetup page or check the Twitter page and you will see the recording. Good stuff. Thank you. And send the last question from RFQ. Uh, Risk Five Linux is capable to run complex application for AI and machine learning. Oof, that's that's out of my league. Well, you know, <laughs> I would say that, let's say yes because you know the, the port is. Yeah. But, but on the other hand, we, are, we don't have you know vector vector support yet, so. It's a kind of broad question, but you know, being the positive guy, I say yes. <laughs> well, uh, as you know, I'm working for the industry, so what I'm seeing right now is that a lot of customers already using Risk Five for AI and machine learning, but it's like several cores. So they so have like one core who is running Linux and having getting the workload, and then is distributing it to other kernels or to other Risk Five cores who are doing the acceleration or who are doing the number crunching, some of them with, like you said, Vector, which is not yet officially from Linux, but if Linux is breaking down the job or the work and forwarding it to smaller cores with Vector, where it's in kind of assembler or real-time operating system based, then it's possible. So I also would be like you say yes, but I would not say it's positive. I would say it's already reality. Yeah, I don't know. Alibaba is working. So Guren is working yeah. on K probes. He's also working on the vectorization support. Yeah. And I know Alibaba has a core that actually, it's, you know, an AI ML core. It's not really my domain, uh, <laughs> but they're they're using it uh, like live in production. But they, I don't think they upstreamed all their patches yet. But I mean, that's the reason why Guren is uh, working on it. I think. Yeah. Okay, great. So I think that has been all the questions so far. Uh, the recording we will put online, like I said before. Uh, I want to thank again every one of the presenters today. It was a great meeting. I really like it. So thank you very much. And please remember that we will have also the the risk five call for papers. So if you have some great topic like our presenters today and you want to share it, go to risk5summit.org, submit your paper, get a speaking slot and speak up in risk five summit. So it will be also a risk five um, in the summer break. We also will have a risk five meeting where they are also asking for ideas. 
So if you want to speak like Burn today, like Gatch, Sabomir, or like, you know, Giom and Raul, Raul, just present your papers. So that would be great. We always look for people also here in the Munich meetup. If you want to speak, like Bjorn just contacted me and said, hey Flo, I have some great things about Linux to tell and Risk Five. can I talk? And we are really happy Bjorn joined today because that was really informative. So if you have something related to Risk Five, contact us and speak. So I would say thank you everyone. Thank you very much for listening and we will put up the slides online. Thanks to all our presenters and have a nice evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Bye.